Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, respected guests and uh, distinguished METI community. Uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, to today's event. As part of the spring program of Matthew uh, 60th anniversary honorary lecture series, today Professor Beatrice Colomina is going to deliver a lecture titled X-ray architecture. Uh, Professor Colomina is a well-known, highly acclaimed name, not only in architecture and architectural history and theory, as her intellectual contribution proves an ample room in an array of disciplines and fields such as gender studies, media and cultural studies, and of course, critical theory. Professor Colomina is a professor of architecture and founding director of media and modernity program at Princeton University. She has written extensively on questions of architecture, art, sexuality, and media. Her books include Sexuality and Space, Privacy and Publicity, Modern Architecture as a Mass Media. It was also translated into Turkish very recently. Uh, domesticity at War, Klim, Stamp Fault, the Radical Architecture of Little Magazines with uh, Craig Buckley, Manifesto Architecture, The Ghost of My uh, Mies uh, with uh, Nicholas Hirsch and Marcus Miesen. Uh, we should also include Are We Human series co edited with Mark Wigley. Uh, who is with us today, sitting right there. Uh, and those series are expected to be available in fall 2016. Professor Colomina has created a series of exhibitions in Venice, Kazel, London, Frankfurt, Barcelona, Santiago de Chile, Bogota, Vancouver, Oslo, Lisbon, New York, Montreal, Warsaw, Rotterdam, Maastricht, and Vienna. She has been working um, uh, with Mark Wigley uh, on uh, the 2016 Istanbul Design Biennale, themed Are We Human? So I believe this is enough for the time being, and the floor is yours. Really, thank you very much uh, for your very generous invitation uh, to come here. I'm really very, very happy to be in Ankara with and in this great uh, university, this great campus, and, and this great school of uh, architecture. Um, I've been many times to Turkey, but always to Istanbul, so it's really very exciting. Uh, for me and for Mark also to, to be in Ankara and to have the opportunity also to visit your, your university. What I'm going to talk about is actually probably my longest uh, preoccupation in terms of, uh, of research, which is this uh, relationship, this bond between architecture and illness that goes back uh, many, many years. In fact, to the first year that I arrived uh, in New York um, in 19, at the end of 1980 after studying architecture uh, in Barcelona. And by some impossibly uh, good luck, I landed as a visiting fellow in the New York uh, Institute for the Humanities that was then run by uh, Richard Sennett and had a fabulous uh, um, uh, fellows. You know, when Richard uh, Sennett offered me to be a fellow there, I didn't really realize what it was going to be because then I, I arrived there and it's Carl Soske, which who was not the age of my father, but the age of my grandfather, and people like uh, Susan Sontag, who was a major, of course, ca a cultural figure, Wolfgang uh, Sibelbus, and so many others. And in fact, this uh, completely uh, uh, affected my way of thinking, this kind of interdisciplinary world that was uh, uh, promoted in this uh, institute, in incredibly changed my way of doing that was very different from what I have learned in the architecture uh, school. At the time, uh, Susan Sontag had just published a little book called Illness as a Metaphor that made an enormous uh, impact on me. 
and all of a sudden I start seeing modern architecture in terms of all the pathologies associated uh, with it, real or imagined, agoraphobia, claustrophobia, nervous disorders, uh, and above all tuberculosis, of course, and the obsession with hygiene, with germs, with fresh air, uh, etc. Um, I thought that this would be a great topic uh, for a dissertation, and in fact that's what I went and, and, and did uh, that year, I wrote like about 100 pages already of my dissertation, but clearly uh, there was not a climate for that kind of, uh, of interdisciplinary research, not in Barcelona um, and not at Columbia University either, where I was a visiting fellow uh, the next uh, year, they kept saying to me, but you should do something more architectural. And I said, but that's architecture. As you will see, it's very architecture. But of course, I ended up working on two canonic figures of modern architecture, Adolf Loos and Le Corbusier, and the question of uh, modern architecture and mass media. This is what became the book, uh, Privacy and uh, Publicity. So I don't have uh, a lot of uh, complaints, but it turned out to be that also the architecture world was not very prepared to hear about modern architecture and media. To hear about Le Corbusier and to talk about media was kind of anathema in the in the 80s. But somehow it all uh, worked out uh, in the end. Um, returning therefore to this theme of the X-rays and the uh, way in which uh, tuberculosis affected the project of modern architecture is for me a little bit like the return of the repress, except that it has always been uh, there in, in, in some Latin form, like a kind of virus uh, that emerges uh, 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 now and then uh, when your defenses are, are low in conferences and in papers and, and, and things like that, but it never completely uh, takes over, and this, this uh, taking over happened actually last year when I was a fellow at the Getty uh, Center uh, in Los Angeles in the spring and at the American Academy in, uh, in Berlin uh, in, the, in the fall, and I decided to take this kind of uh, all uh, preoccupation and turn it into, into a book that will come out uh, also relatively soon, next year as well. So what is the hypothesis of this book is actually uh, quite uh, simple, uh, uh, that modern architecture in fact was saved by the dominant medical obsession of its time with tuberculosis and the technologies uh, that became associated, the technology that became associated with it, which is the X-ray. Um, it is as if in a way the widespread uh, uh, success of modern architecture depended in a way in its association uh, with health. Its interna internationalization that has always been so much talk about may have also to do with the global spread of the disease, the disease it was meant to, to kind of uh, resist. In fact, a map showing uh, the distribution of modern architecture in the world will echo the map of uh, a distribution of uh, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, of course, is a fundamentally urban uh, uh, disease. One in seven people in the planet died for tuberculosis, from tuberculosis in the 19th century. But if you focus, for example, just in one city, like the city of Paris, one in three was dying of tuberculosis. So that was a major, uh, of course, uh, event that affected all areas of, uh, of our production, not just medicine, but art, uh, music, uh, literature, etc. And there have been numerous studies of the impact of tuberculosis in all these fields. But for the field of modern architecture, it's like we were completely blind to this fact and we have talked about architecture in modern architecture in every kind of possible uh, way, functionalism, new techniques, new materials, etc., etc. And perhaps we forgot what was more obvious, what was more in our face, which is the, the fact that modern architecture was responding to a huge uh, health crisis. Modernity, in fact, I will argue, is driven uh, by illness. The engine of modern architecture is not a heroic, uh, shiny, uh, functional machine marching across the globe, but a languid, uh, kind of fragile uh, body suspended outside daily life in a protective uh, cocoon of new technologies and geometries. It is uh, the difficulty of each breath, and therefore the treasure of each breath, the melancholy of modernity, then, that I'm interested uh, to talk about. The architecture of the early 20th century, then, cannot be, as I say, 
understood outside tuberculosis. Indeed, if you think about it, the principles of modern architecture seem to be taken straight out from a medical test on the disease, which a year before the, and this is Rusan Sontag, I forgot to show her uh, before, who so much influenced my understanding of, uh, of uh, architecture at that point, even if she doesn't talk about architecture. Uh, uh, she's talking, of course, about literature and the impact of tuberculosis on literature. A year uh, before the German uh, microbiologist uh, Robert Koch uh, discovered the tubercle uh, bacillus in 1882, a standard medical book on the disease named as the causes of tuberculosis and favorable climate, sedentary indoor life, defective, ven defective ventilation, and deficiency of light. Those were the causes of the disease uh, a year before the discovery of the bacillus of the tuberculosis. But in fact, it took a long time for these uh, notions to lose credibility. As Susan uh, Sontag writes or wrote, the tuberculosis patient was thought to be helped, even cured by a change of environment. There was a notion that TB was a wet disease, a disease of the humid and dank cities, and the inside of the body uh, became damp uh, uh, and needed to be uh, dried out. This is Robert Koch and the hospital in La Charité in Berlin, uh, where he discovered the uh, bacillus and the paper that he uh, 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 published. Modern architecture, in response to this huge uh, crisis, offers health uh, precisely by providing uh, such a change of environment. 19th century architecture, as represented, for example, in this poster of the Bourbon uh, Sea and Lung, uh, was uh, immediately demonized as unhealthy, and sun, light, uh, air, uh, ventilation, uh, hygiene, uh, wideness, etc., were offered precisely as a means to prevent, if not to cure, uh, tuberculosis. The publicity campaign of modern architecture, in that sense, was uh, overly organized uh, around contemporary fears and uh, beliefs about the disease. In his book, uh, uh, The Radiant City, uh, Le Corbusier, for example, this is a book of uh, 1935, the, Le Corbusier uh, dismisses, rejects the, the, so what he calls the natural ground, uh, that he calls a dispenser of tuberculosis and rheumatism, and declares to be the enemy of man. And it's for that reason that he insists on detaching uh, the house from the wet, humid ground where the seas uh, uh, breeds, and uh, with the help of these uh, uh, pilotis, this uh, a thin uh, uh, column and insist also on using uh, the flat roof as a garden for sunbathing and exercising. Of course, nobody seems to know anything about the skin uh, cancer and that will be, become the obsession of the next uh, generation, of the generation of the 30s that were all like in the sun, now are, uh, oh, is this good or is this bad? So it's always uh, a disease that shapes our, our understanding. Uh, to reinforce the point, uh, Le Corbusier actually uses pictures that are taken from medical uh, books as architectural illustrations, uh, showing the lungs and the our inner workings, while actually giving architectural illustrations, sometimes medical labels. Like, for example, when this uh, photograph of historic Paris, he calls it tubercular uh, Paris. So behind uh, uh, his decision to kind of, uh, you remember that he tries to erase uh, most of the center of, of Paris is a health uh, uh, crisis. In the book, uh, Le Corbusier also de developed this concept of uh, exact uh, uh, respiration, whereby uh, the indoor air is continuously circulated and clean, made dust-free uh, and disinfected and ready to be consumed by the land. In fact, he's talking about what we now consider air conditioning, but there was not air conditioning. But look at how he's presenting. He's, pre he's cleaning the air to make it dust-free, disinfected, and ready to be consumed by the land. Right? One by one, all the characteristics uh, of modern features of modern architecture, the pilotis, uh, the roof garden, the glass walls, the clean air, uh, are presented uh, in Le Corbusier and many modern architectures actually as medical uh, devices. Even the white walls meant to reveal, uh, are meant to reveal contamination and are given the same uh, status uh, as, a, as a diagnostic tool like the X-rays as when Le Corbusier uh, writes in uh, L'Art de Creative de in 1925, the house, if the house is all white, the outline of things standing out from it without 
any possibility of mistake. Everything stands out from it and is recorded absolutely black and white. It is honest and dependable. It's rather like an X-ray of beauty. So not only he's talking about all these features of modern architecture in terms of medical things, but he also specifically talks about uh, the X-ray. And of course, uh, the X-ray is in, in no way a metaphor. Anything excessive in modern uh, architecture is eliminated. All the objects are presented as if they were seen through an X-ray uh, machine. Uh, the corpus metaphor, as I say, was in no way accidental. Diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis continued to be uh, very difficult, with doctors confusing it with other illnesses, including bronchitis, chronic indigestion, malaria, neurasthenia, antifoid fever. So they have no idea where they were uh, talking about. And they had this uh, enormous desire to see inside the, the body to uh, 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 evaluate it. In fact, the technology of the X-ray had been already available in uh, sanatoria since the beginning of the century for those already showing signs of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the disease. Screening uh, 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 the body, but in the 20s becomes part of the routine examination of anybody, so that's the difference. In the early 20th century, you are in a sanatorium, then the X-ray as a kind of uh, uh, new technology is used, but uh, the population in general was not screened, right? Screening the body uh, for tuberculosis, of course, meant optically penetrating uh, the areas of the body that were previously invisible. X-rays uh, created a new kind of vision in that sense, a new paradigm of truths that architects could not resist. Nothing could be more modern if you read people like the Corbusier. Of course, one could write an entire book about the impact of tuberculosis in early uh, 20th century architecture, beginning actually with the close collaborations between architects and doctors. Uh, very from the beginning of the century, they were collaborating in designing uh, tuberculosis sanatoriums, like this one, it's a little bit late, it's Alvaro Alto uh, by Imio of uh, 1928 in Finland. Uh, with its dramatic uh, uh, terraces uh, in the skies. Even the building bears in a, a kind of resemblance in, a, in this canonic photograph to kind of a x-ray of the, of the chest. Uh, it's clean line uh, bedrooms, totally devoid of ornament, were designed to minimize uh, surfaces where dust could accumulate, um, and, and were equipped with every sanitary fitting that was also designed by the architects. So the architects are involved in all these details of the of the of the sanatoria but you know in fact you look at these bedrooms and you could live here it's not very different from a modern apartment uh, buildings that were being designed at the same time so this is the interesting thing that we start designing for sanatorium before we know we are living in a sanatorium <laughs> or ourselves like a form of prevention from this uh, uh, terrible uh, threat uh, at the time but the main uh, technology of this building was this top uh, floor uh, terrace where the uh, patients were wheeled out to take the sun and air and fresh air uh, um, uh, cure, uh, sometimes as long as uh, 10 hours uh, a day. And you can imagine, this is uh, Paimio, this is north of, uh, of Helsinki, this is really cold most of the, of the time. And this is what happened, that eventually the terrace had to be uh, close off because the, the staff, the nurses, couldn't keep up with the number of uh, patients that uh, will throw themselves out of the, of the, uh, down from the, from the terror. So modern architecture acting in somehow as a kind of form of uh, assisted uh, uh, suicide. <laughs> the discovery of antibiotics and particularly of uh, streptomycin uh, revealed that there was not a lot of scientific evidence. Uh, for this kind of air and, and sun uh, therapy. Sometimes it even precipitated the end at Paimio uh, quite literally. The history of uh, modern architecture is totally full of uh, sanatoriums. Think about uh, Hoffman's uh, uh, Burkersdorf outside uh, Vienna. Uh, with its purified white surfaces, radically sharp lines and cubic uh, furniture and even its uh, gridded ferro-concrete ceiling uh, uh, that, is posed, uh, that was exposed and painted uh, white. At the time of, uh, it was built, uh, a critic called Ludwig Kebesi described it as the naked Hoffman uh, building, 
whose walls were lined with porcelain uh, white uh, tiles, a white painted, a white tile washable uh, uh, wall. So again, it's presented all in terms of hygiene. Hevesi was so impressed that he decided to check himself into the sanatorio and to personally test some of the therapeutic uh, machines, such as these ones in the mechanical uh, therapy room, which was full of electric uh, massage machines and other uh, things. Electricity itself, by the way, and I don't have a lot of time to go into it, was understood a hygienic mechanical uh, instrument. The building was constructed uh, as part of an earlier uh, sanatorium that had been founded by this uh, psychiatrist that you see there, Richard von Krafted Eben, who died before the Purkersdorf uh, was completed, but who had been very influential in the theories of the Purkersdorf. Uh, von Krafted Eben had argued that modern metropolis was damaging the nerves of the inhabitants and that air, light, nature, and simplicity will be a very effective therapy. In 1885, he wrote uh, this book on healthy and uh, uh, sick nerves, and a year later, psychopathia sexuali. Sexualis, he coined or at least popularized such terms as uh, sadism and masochism after uh, the author Sucker Masoch. Health uh, for uh, this fellow was understood in psychosexual and architectural terms. The Purkesdorf was frequented by a notable uh, circle of patients, including Gustav Mahler, uh, Arnold Somber, Colomer Moser here below, and uh, who designed the furniture of the, of the place, Hugo von Hofmannsthal uh, here, and even the architect, Joseph Hoffman, on the right, accepted, uh, even uh, he sometimes joined uh, this, uh, this, this group, because this is the incredible thing at the time, that these sanatoriums were not just accepting people with tuberculosis. To have tuberculosis was, in a way, kind of a fascinable thing. So all kinds of people in culture will check themselves in this uh, sanatorium. And in particular, in the Purkersdorf, they will check themselves with all kinds of uh, uh, medical conditions, including nervous disorders, neurasthenia, eating disorders, substance abuse, and hysteria. This is uh, Colomon Moser, as I said, the designer of the furniture. I'm not so sure what he was suffering from, but here you have him in a photograph around the time that the Purkesdorf was uh, built, and this is uh, the famous furniture that Colomon uh, Moser uh, designed. Critics uh, hailed the, the building as one of clarity and truth. The success of the institution owe enormously to the modernity of the architecture. Modern was becoming a new and sophisticated uh, taste among the bourgeoisie and the intelligentsia in Vienna, who were supposed to dine around a single white uh, table as a kind of talking uh, cure, and sleeping what they were understood at the time as Spartan uh, white rooms, and subject themselves to the regimes of treatment in white uh, spaces. The association of uh, white cubic uh, forms with mental and physical health was already so strong uh, among, uh, to act as a kind of effective placebo. So we don't know whether the cure was effective, but definitely people believed that it was, and therefore it was to a certain effect effective. But what is interesting is that the architecture, modern architecture, was acting as a placebo for all kinds of uh, uh, disorders. Um, Bonecraft Evin seems also to have been extremely uh, influential in architects and urban planners, such as Camilo uh, City, who you see here. Camilo City also criticized um, the modern metropolis, the modern city, because in his view it was causing agoraphobia and other nervous uh, conditions. In his book, uh, City Planning According to Artistic uh, Principles, he advocates uh, for intimate uh, urban spaces that are like in a medieval city protecting the inhabitant. Also, out of laws, uh, you can say also a student of masochismo, he, he, there are multiple references in his writings to, to masochismo, argues that the man with the modern uh, nerves, these are some lectures that he gave uh, in, uh, in, in Paris at, at La Sorbonne, uh, cannot tolerate any more uh, ornament, just as he can no longer eat stuffed animal corpses covered with, uh, with plumes, with feathers. The dishes of past centuries, he says, which use decoration to make peacocks, pheasants, and lobsters appear more appetizing, produce the opposite effect on me. I look on such culinary displays with horror, particularly if I think I have to eat one of these stuffed animal corpses. I only eat roast beef. Right? 
So roast beef is an abstract meat. He can, I thought he was going to say he was vegetarian, but no. <laughs> I only eat roast beef. So or roast beef or meat is of course very roast beef is very abstract. I don't see all this. So he makes this association with ornament and also this uh, culinary displays in which the animal is uh, quite uh, and he feels this uh, uh, is not is the man with the modern nurse, which is the modern individual, can no longer do, deal with with this. This obsession with the nurse. Um, I, I thought it was just a pianist thing, you know, after all, this is the Vienna of Freud and all of this. But in fact, it's uh, all over. For example, just looking back at uh, Paul Server, who wrote uh, uh, the famous book Glass Architecture in 1914, and he says sanatoria will also want glass buildings. The influence of a splendid glass architecture on the nerve is indisputable. Indisputable. Right. So that's what they were thinking uh, at that time. Davos uh, in Switzerland was, of course, the epicenter of the phenomena of the modern cure. Uh, in 1910, there were already as many as 26 sanatoriums in Davos and 46 hotels that catered to the consumptives. The Schwalbs is one of the most uh, famous ones, built between 1899 and 900. It was actually a collaboration, again, between a doctor, a famous uh, doctor, and two young um, modern architects from Zurich. Uh, he became the model for the modern uh, sanatorium, but it was also the first building in Switzerland to use con uh, uh, and to be constructed in reinforced uh, concrete and steel. So you see here what is happening all along. The most advanced medical research collaborates with the most advanced uh, technical research in architecture. And this is something that we have excluded from our histories of modern architecture, but it's uh, actually very interesting now that we talk so much about interdisciplinarity, well, it was happening at the, at the time in these uh, uh, collab collaborations. The architecture of the Schwartz is uh, uh, brutally modern in its horizontality and abstractions with its 100 meters long facades and endless uh, corridors. The building is like an ocean liners uh, in which all parts are in fact subordinated to the terrace, which is the therapeutic space which are dimensioned by a patient that is reclining in one of these specially designed uh, launches. Um, in winter and in summer, you have this period uh, uh, photographs with patients in the, in the, in the chair, uh, which were there actually from the early morning until the evening. And they do it in the, in the summer, but also in the winter, as you can see in this photograph, because they are all in practically entirely covering in, in, in a blanket of snow, and they seem totally happy. If you go back to the other one, I mean, there are still people from the staff offering tea, and everybody's kind of, uh, okay, this woman on the front is really not very happy, and this guy in the middle is trying to see whether he can get something going, but it's not going to happen, right? She's really upset. But by the time you go here, I mean, they all seem to be like, <laughs> they, they have been left alone, there is no staff, they are there with the broom, right? But they seem to be uh, a lot happier, and these guys are still actually there, because, you know, people will go for, for years uh, to these kind of uh, places to cure themselves um, in the, from tuberculosis. Thomas Mann, uh, always very sensitive to architectural detail in his novel, is very interesting now to uh, look back at the magic mountain and realize that when he's, talk, was, when he's presenting the story of this uh, Hans Castor in the sanatorium in, uh, in Davos, he's actually talking about modern architecture. There's a huge amount of modern architecture in the magic uh, man. And he also describes in great de detail this therapeutic uh, uh, chaise long uh, with care, uh, evoking a philosophy of life on the edge of the horizon in the horizontal. The therapy of the horizontal was, of course, also central to the Bald uh, Sanatorium, another famous sanatorium in Davos, where Katia Mann, Thomas uh, Mann's uh, wife, stayed, and which inspired him to write uh, the famous novel, The Magic Mountain. Mann's novel evoked the social life in this very modern building where everything uh, was white, even the architecture of the uh, painting that you see here wrap up in, in some way to receive uh, um, hydrotherapy. So everything is absolutely white. Katia was, in fact, one of the very first uh, patients in this brand new sanatorium. She fell ill in 1912, a year after the birth of her fourth uh, uh, 
uh, child. Her mother actually was completely convinced that she didn't suffer from tuberculosis, but from exhaustion, which is already a very kind of characteristic kind of disease of the 19th century. Having had four children in quick succession and two miscarriages, uh, all of this in less than, than, than five years, managing a large household, and even typing uh, man, uh, Thomas Mann's manuscripts. Whatever her ailment, uh, she stayed in and out of sanatoriums um, uh, up to 1914. And actually, she said the experience had strengthened her to, uh, to stand all that was to come. And of course, a lot was to, to come, including uh, World War I, uh, etc. The irony here of uh, Katia typing the manuscript of Mann and all of this is that she had been asked by her mother to uh, abandon her studies of uh, physics and mathematics at the age of 21 to marry uh, a man. And also it's an irony because she was the granddaughter of a great uh, feminist um, uh, German uh, woman, Hedwig, Hedwig uh, Don. Uh, uh, so it's a kind of a little bit uh, uh, incredible. Uh, but in fact, she says she had been uh, uh, strengthened by the experience of the sanatorium. Almost everybody spoke in very positive terms of this experience in the sanatory and then went back to, uh, 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 to home and had two more children. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, the modern ocean liner for the rich and the fabulous, you can say, became democratized, democratized with sanatorium such as the Thonestral uh, in Hilversum in 1925-28, 20 miles outside Amsterdam. Thonestral actually means sun, uh, sun beam in Dutch, it was designed by Jan Ducker and Bernard Bijoué as a sanatorium for the General Diamond uh, Workers' Union in the Netherlands. Uh, it's all in reinforced concrete, uh, uh, again, you know, the highest technology associated with the highest experimentation uh, in, uh, uh, in medicine. This, uh, uh, um, this uh, kind of reinforced concrete white building, the medical properties of the architecture are taken uh, to the stream almost as a manifesto. Thonestral is a kind of a health uh, machine, a factory for the manufacturing of healthy bodies. It's a slogan that you can see there, lat licht lucht, uh, which means allow light, air, and sun. Uh, here the patients are wheeled out uh, in their independent rooms into these terrace, which are no longer a social space as we saw in Davos uh, or in earlier sanatorios, but they seem to be less interaction between the patients, as you can see here, because they seem to keep their head inside the rooms and into their books, so it has become some other uh, kind of uh, space. The only interaction is with the sun and with the machines, which have become complex instruments, such as this late, latest respiratory analysis uh, devices. I first thought that the individual uh, rooms in a worker's uh, sanatorium was a uh, great advance uh, socially, but re reading again Thomas uh, Benhorn, whose novel are also full of uh, stories about tuberculosis, I realized that the really terrifying thing in a sanatorium was when you were moved into an individual room. That could mean only one thing, right? You were dying. Death itself was actually hidden. Sanatoriums in Davos did not accept uh, very ill uh, patients. A death, of course, was a spot in their reputation, so they were very careful about who they admitted in their sanatorium. They even exaggerated their rate of cure, and subterranean uh, tunnels carried the dead away and out of view. And at the Swalps, which is uh, 300 meters above the town of Davos, the bodies of the dead were sent down the mountain uh, on top of us in winter, as man describes in the Magic Mountain. Well, I could continue with this kind of... Uh, Fascinating, I think, is fascinating history of the sanatorium. But I am actually uh, interested in something else. More interesting uh, or more significant than the architecture of the sanatorium type is for me the impact of medical uh, thought, of medical discourse on modern architecture. Uh, the constant preoccupation with ventilation, with sunlight, with hygiene, with white walls, as Ulrich uh, puts it in Robert Musil's uh, uh, famous novel, uh, The Man uh, Without Qualities, a uh, modern man, uh, he writes, uh, is born in a hospital and then dies in a hospital. Hence, he should be also living in a place like a hospital. So I think it's 
quite interesting to look at literature, actually, to see how all these references to the seas and to modern architecture emerge there. Of course, this is the first generation that will be born in a hospital and will die in a hospital. And he makes this reflection, and he goes on to add that this uh, has been formulated by leading architects. And another one, he says, uh, a reformer of interior decoration is demanded movable uh, partition walls in flats. So again, like the partition walls in, in hospitals. So he makes, Robert Musil is also making this association between modern architecture and hospital. In fact, you can say that every building at a certain point becomes like a sanatorium in modern architecture. Take, for example, the open air school in Amsterdam, which was built in 1929, a couple of years after the Sonnestral and by the very same architects, um, Duiker and Bijoe, who applies the same principles of light, sun, air, ventilation, but now to healthy uh, children. They were placed like inside a glass machine and even required to sit up in the roof with heads against this uh, glass parapet in the bright sun with their sunglasses on. The building is conceived as a light device, like those that were being used at the time also for uh, light therapy uh, in the 30s in all these countries that don't have enough sun. They have this, uh, and all these kids, of course, that were as preventive measure were exposed to, to this kind of, uh, of radiation, of course, they have all kinds of, um, of, of, uh, of problems. Um, the open air school was actually an international movement that started with the bald uh, uh, a schooler in Berlin, in Charlottenburg, which opened in 1904 for what they call pre-tubercular uh, children, and then I spread around the world in architecture, uh, ranging from lightweight weight structures like uh, this one to metal and concrete buildings like this one in the south of France, um, uh, okay, uh, where the structure uh, uh, is uh, um, exposed, almost like the bones of the building are exposed at the same time that the bones of the body are being uh, exposed. But what is interesting and what is radical, of course, about the uh, open air school in Amsterdam, it is that it's for healthy children. So now we go from, from designing an architecture that protects a person that is sick already to um, uh, somehow uh, design uh, for prevention. So modern architecture uh, prevents uh, disease in all individuals. Modern architects were not only uh, uh, the ones advocating uh, life in a sanatorium, but their promoters, the critics, the historians were also doing so. Take, for example, uh, uh, Siegfried Gideon. In 1929, he wrote this little book, Brefitte uh, Warning, Liberated uh, Dwelling, that has the, this title, Light, Air, Opening, almost like the slogan of the Sonestral. And between the covers of this uh, book about the modern house that I discovered also in an old bookstore when I arrived uh, uh, in New York, and I was struck by it because I opened the house, oh, a nice book of Gideon that I didn't know. It seems to be all on the modern house. And I opened the book, and it, in the book is full of hospitals, and uh, like the Richard Docker here, and, and the Thonestral, and again the patients in the Thonestral, and our, uh, hospitals in, in Davos, and Estadia, and sunbathing, and exercise, and, and, and then, but you know, I've made, as well have forgotten that I bought a little book on the house because I have, I'm like at the end of the book and I haven't found any house yet. But this is the shocking part because by the time I get to the houses, I realize that the houses themselves have been turned into sanatorium with the client, a patient of tuberculosis, <coughs> resting on the terrace and in, as in this uh, photographs of a must have uh, house um, in Zurich of 1928, or the house has been turned into a gym, like in Martha Breuer uh, bedroom for Piscator in Berlin, or uh, in this uh, also terrace of Richard Docker in the Bourbon Siedlung uh, in Stuttgart. And Gideon was not the only uh, one, the only critic obsessed with uh, tuberculosis. He had reason to be interested in tuberculosis. Everybody had tuberculosis. Uh, his wife had been in Davos for a long time. The first wife, the second wife of uh, Adolf Loos also died from tuberculosis and he spent a lot of time in Davos. So all of them, either they had been themselves in a sanatorium or they were connected to someone very close to them and had spent time in the sanatorium. So this is part of the culture that they are so familiar with. So another influential book, uh, Richard Docker, The Rust and Tip, of 1927 follows the development of terraces in modern architecture from the sanatorium, the Kranken House, 
uh, to uh, 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 the modern uh, house, um, uh, starting with his own uh, sanatorium in by blinking. Uh, here are some images, and then Thonestral, and then Thonestral, and then Davos again, and more Davos with all these people taking the sun, and uh, you know diagrams showing the 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 angle of the of the uh, of the sun and before we know we are making this seamless transition from the terraces of the sanatorium to the terraces of modern uh, houses um, uh, and the book concludes with a series of uh, photographs of domestic terraces that have been turned into exercise uh, uh, gyms you no know? like in Docker's own apartment in the Weissenhof or Le Corbusier's or Robert Marette Stevens uh, Villa Noel's uh, in years. In fact, one of the first articles covering this house in Art uh, et Decoration in July of 1928 described the house as organized by a cult of hygiene. Sunlight, exercise, and fresh air are taking precedence over traditional forms of comfort. And this is a house, of course, for a very wealthy uh, client. And that's why this uh, French magazine emphasizes this. The master. Um, the bedrooms uh, are very modest in size for the period, but each one of them is connected to its own bathroom and uh, terrace for outdoor sleeping, as for example in this outdoor sleeping area of the master uh, bedroom designed by uh, uh, Pierre Sarot. The Noes uh, were collectors of surrealist uh, art, and their paintings were kept also dust-free, dust was an obsession at the time, of course, in a sliding uh, storage system organized like a vertical uh, filing cabinet. There was also a covered uh, swimming pool with a mechanism that was uh, uh, conceived by Jean Prouvé. And the, the house had also a squash uh, court where uh, the client Charles de Noé played with Luis Buñuel. There was even a personal trainer for uh, the guest, Monsieur uh, Tare, who features in some films uh, where all the uh, clients are exercising in the house. They also, the clients, commissioned Man Ray to do a film uh, of their house, using the house as a set for endless uh, exercise confused with surrealist uh, play, as you can see here. And the crazy, crazy thing is, the, the interesting about this uh, film is that the clients and their guests are themselves actors in a strip exercise uh, year. Of course, you could say, oh, this is kind of eccentric thing of these uh, fellows. But in fact, eccentric or no, uh, what is interesting to, to know is that Marie Lord uh, uh, and Charles de Noël uh, were also uh, uh, more than interested in, in, in the arts. And they were uh, also many of the so called fragile people who came to this part of France precisely to soften, they use that language, to soften their illness. They saw air and sun and, and ventilation to, and, uh, to, to kind of uh, um, uh, reinforce their immune system. Marie Laure, uh, who you see here in this uh, portrait, uh, was born in Paris, the daughter of German Jewish uh, bankers, and descendant, by the way, on her mother's side uh, from the Marquise de Sade, had been raised in a villa in the south of France for health reasons. Her father had died of tuberculosis when she was a baby. So this uh, move to this area of France has again have to do with tuberculosis. It's all in her family history. And then you can explain this, uh, the design of this house also in these terms. Modern architecture is occupied and organized around two emblematic figures the fragile tuberculosis patient seeking a cure and the athletic uh, figure seeking uh, prevention from the diseases of modernity. Even the body of the architect, this is Aino Alto in the terrace of uh, Alvaro Alto and Aino Alto's Paimio restaurant, the chair is even uh, designed by her. This is not actually the typical photograph of the heroic architect in front of the building. The architect herself decides to present herself in a photograph as, a, as an ill uh, person uh, resting on the, on the terrace of her, uh, of her uh, uh, sanatorium. Oh, this is Richard Docker, the architect of the Thonestral, who also presents himself flipping into, uh, into this pond, portraying the architect again not uh, in the heroic uh, position, but more or less in this active position of the outlet in this, uh, on the outdoors. Is this uh, okay? 
Can I do something? Okay, fireworks. <laughs> so between the languid figure of the architect and the athletic figure, it seems like the architects themselves present, present themselves also as models in this, uh, in this uh, story. Not only did modern architects emphasize uh, health and exercise in opposition to the dangers uh, of the disease sometimes presenting themselves as models, but their architecture was also understood uh, that way. You hear? Yes? Yes, okay. Um, the building became unconsciously uh, identified with the healthy body. I give you an example of the Tudenhout uh, house, the famous Tudenhout house of Miss van der Rohe, who was uh, abandoned during the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. And then uh, when the communists took over, they turned it precisely into a gym, a gym for handicapped uh, children. So they, they were probably completely unaware that the house itself had been uh, photographed in its early days in exactly the same spirit. So these early photographs of the uh, two and had uh, kids in the 1930s uh, playing in the sun in the terrace are uncannily echo in the 1960s image of children exercise in the living room uh, gym. Modern architecture, in other words, was understood as a kind of medical equipment, a mechanism for protecting and enhancing uh, the body. It's interesting to me that these bureaucrats, these communist bureaucrats that took over the house, immediately say, oh, what do we do with this? Oh, it's a gym, right? So they made immediately the association again with health and exercise. But even entire cities, uh, were imagined in, uh, in uh, health terms. Of course, there is Howard, mm, Evident Howard Garden City, and Arturo Soria y Mata, Ciudad Lineal, and many, or Le Corbusier's uh, Radiant City, or Wagner. So they are all full of references to the seas. Uh, I only will mention uh, the Cité Indus Industrial of Tony Garniel, the industrial city of 904, that also has the leotherapy uh, building in the highest uh, uh, point in the, in the plan, dominating the city from the hillside, and the sports center right in the middle of town. So as if, if we are replacing the cathedral of medieval times. Health in the 20th century had become a new form of religion. Gideon, uh, and here's the leotherapy uh, building, Gideon uh, describes um, uh, the building in the following uh, way. Elevators carry the convalescent in his bed to the generous terraces to which the roof had been converted. The eye through the interplay of the various horizontal surfaces has an impression of the air always separating and hovering. Uh, Gideon's emphasis on the horizontality of both the architecture and the convalescent suggests uh, to me a completely different uh, explanation or understanding of the horizontality of modern architecture that those that I have myself uh, provided uh, when I associated modern architecture with a film in the book that we just mentioned, uh, Privacy and, uh, and Publicity. Could it be that the relentless horizontal framing of modern architecture, in fact, is related to the horizontality of the occupant, the tuberculosis uh, convalescent lying on the chest, and perhaps also the psychoanalytic uh, uh, patient on the couch? Uh, you can say that the whole 20th century was on the horizontal, whether because of tuberculosis or uh, on the therapy. Modern buildings even started at a certain point uh, to start looking like medical images. The impact of the technology of the X-rays, which is of course the dominant uh, diagnostic tool for uh, lung tuberculosis, is evident in the work of early avant-garde architects uh, for example, Mies writes about his work as a skin and bones architecture and renders the project, such as this uh, uh, skyscraper in the Friedrichstrasse of 1919 and then glass skyscraper in 1922, as if they were seeing the building through an X-ray uh, machine. Those images are unimaginable before the X-rays. In fact, uh, many people have studied uh, Mies, but nobody seems to have realized that he was very interested in x-rays, he even collected uh, x-rays, like this one that he even uh, 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 published. And he even puts uh, uh, the bone, uh, uh, the image of a bone uh, alongside his glass uh, skyscrapers in some of his uh, 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 publications, such as this uh, one. But this was by no ways, uh, no means alone. 
books on modern architecture, you could argue, are full of images of glowing glass skins revealing inner bones and organs. They look, in a way, like uh, album uh, uh, images of X-rays that were actually very popular in the in the early 20th century, and, and you know they were albums of uh, X-rays, uh, and, and this they look like this in in so many ways. Think, for example, about the Corbusier project of the glass skyscraper of 1925. Again, the Corbusier, Walter Gropius Bauhaus, uh, um, Van Nelle factory in in Rotterdam, uh, Mendelssohn Socken department store. Uh, George Keck uh, Crystal House in the World's Fair of 1933, uh, and so many other examples, such as these more anonymous uh, glass palace um, in the uh, Netherlands here during the day and at night, and many other uh, examples like uh, back Mr. Fuller, the Amaxion uh, 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 Tower. This, in, in many ways, is much more than a dominant aesthetic. It's a symptom of a deep-seated philosophy of design that is actually deriving from medical uh, discourse. The X-ray was also integral uh, to a new discourse about transparency. Uh, Arthur Korn, a remarkable uh, book uh, of 1927, uh, Glass in Construction and as Commodity, catalogues the new use of glass in architecture and remarks, as if completely surprised, the outside wall is no longer the first impression one gets of a building. It is the interior, the spaces in depth, and the structural frame which delineates them that one begins to notice through the glass uh, walls. Glass is noticeable, yet uh, not quite visible. It is the great mem membrane, full of mystery, yet delicate, yet tough. Right? So this surprise of the critic that the first impression is no longer the facade, but what you see through, and this sense of mystery, this blurry images that uh, emerges, uh, as for example in these photographs of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Bauhaus, I think there is an echo to what uh, uh, um, Rodgen experienced in his discussion, discovery of the X-ray, where also in the very first uh, uh, parts of this paper that he published on the X-ray, he also talks about a new kind of transparency, right? in the very first uh, publication. Just as the body of the Bauhaus uh, building that you just saw appears strangely blurry through the not quite visible glass, Drongen writes about the flesh becoming a kind of mysterious shadow where the bones are perfectly uh, visible. And here uh, you have uh, these guys experimenting uh, because uh, just to close, I want to make the connection that actually the development of X-ray and of modern architecture actually uh, move in, in, in parallel. They coincide and they evolve in parallel. If experiments with glass were numerous in the early parts of the century, and they still to tend to be isolated, exoteric projects by avant-garde uh, architects, like for example, think about uh, 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 Bruno Tau's uh, glass building in, in Cologne. Also the experiments of the scientists were also uh, tentative and, and not quite uh, established year, year. Here you have these guys that I don't know exactly what they are doing, and then you have uh, Taut's, uh, Bruno Taut's glass building for, for the Bourbon exhibition in Cologne, or think about uh, Miss Bar Barcelona Pavilion, or the unrealized project of the glass house on the hillside. All of these are, are really experimental projects. Mies really didn't know how to build this, but he had the, the idea they were still uh, experimenting uh, with it. Only by mid-century, in 1949, to make it more precise, does the completely transparent uh, house uh, become realized in Mies Farnsworth House in uh, Illinois and Philip Johnson uh, Glass House in Connecticut. Just as the X-ray exposes the inside of the body to the public eye, modern architecture also decides that it has to expose uh, the interior. Um, both the X-ray and the glass house become also a mass phenomenon. You may think, oh, who owns a Farnsworth house or who owns the glass house? But they really become a mass phenomenon with the introduction of the popular picture window. This is actually for a, an advertisement for a picture window in the, in the 50s when everybody's uh, house has a picture window. 
And of course, it's not just the house that at mid-century has to reveal its interior. Everything has to be see-through, from the pirates' uh, cookware to the salam wrap for, for the food, to the windows in Owens and in washing machine. I mean, I understand the oven. You can't have to see what is, how is it going. But why do you have to see what the washing machine is doing exactly? So <laughs> this uh, absolute desire to see inside is like an X-ray of our things uh, uh, as well. Even in cars, like this uh, advertisement of a Jeep, uh, the world's biggest X-ray, or uh, this Volkswagen, which is called the Medicar, uh, by the way, um, a shoe store from the 1950s on had X-ray machines without any kind of protection from radioactivity. They were only banned in the 70s, so there were all these stores where to fit your shoes, you will put your, uh, your shoe into this X-ray machine. Who knows what happened to the feet of all that generation of, of people constantly playing with the machines in the, in the shoe store, and they had no awareness about what the radiation uh, was doing uh, today. Screening uh, the body for uh, tuberculosis, of course, meant penetrating with the gaze, with the eye, areas of the body previously invisible. The technology, as I say, had been available in sanatorium since the beginning of the century, but in the 30s became part of the campaign to X-ray uh, the whole uh, uh, population on a regular uh, basis. With this uh, development, the now invisible, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of inter interesting because it becomes so popular. Now you not only to talk with love, not only the picture of your rosy. Uh, also, it's very interesting. If you I, you will have noticed that, right? That if you don't know anything and you have never heard of tuberculosis, you will think it's a disease of women, right? Because all, there are all women in this uh, in this uh, photo. But in fact, it was much more prevalent in men. But they are, they are the women that are constantly in the, in the picture, like, uh, you know, if you were not uh, able to read and only to see the images, you would say, oh, yeah, this is a disease. To tone with all my love, no? So you show not only the picture of your rosy, healthy self, but also the picture of, uh, of your x-ray. So you were clean <laughs> inside and out, right? And there were all these popular places, uh, even with bands uh, around, so people will do their x-ray. And it's a new kind of uh, portrait. Uh, the association of X-rays with glass houses, which I have made here, actually was a common place in mid-century popular culture. For example, in this film of highlights and shadows that was done by the Kodak uh, company, uh, trying to convince people to, to have X-rays because people were afraid of X-rays, but they were not afraid of the radiation. They had no idea the radiation was by. They were afraid of the loss of privacy, the invasion of privacy. That's what they were resisting to. Uh, uh, to the x-ray. So in this film, the narrator, who of course the woman is a woman strapped to this uh, laboratory table in her swimming suit, and the narrator, who is a man, declares that this young lady, who henceforth a glass house should hold no terror, so who therefore will not be ever afraid again of a glass house, will be, after an examination of an x-ray, be reassured that, is, that she is uh, indeed physically fit. Okay, so that makes sense, right? You see your x-rays and you are reassured that you are physically fit, but the sentence that he put in the middle is the interesting one, because he says that from now on, we'll no longer be afraid to live in a glass house, right? <laughs> so it's unbelievable, no? That in the middle of trying to convince pe people to have their x-ray, you are convincing them that it will be okay also to live in a glass house, passive. And when you think that, well, maybe this is a funny thing of popular culture, the interesting that this is also in the canonic discourse around modern architecture. For example, this is uh, Edith Fansworth, the famous uh, client of Miss for the Fansworth uh, house and a very important uh, doctor in her own uh, right, that uh, writes in an interview about her house. Uh, she is not very happy after all. And she says, I don't keep a garbage can under my sink. Do you know why? Because you can see the whole kitchen from the road on the way here, and the can will spoil the appearance of the whole house. So I have to hide it in the closet, further down from the sink. Miss talks about free space, but this space is very fixed. I can even put a close handle in my house without considering how it will affect everything from the outside. Any arrangement of furniture becomes a major problem because the house is transparent like an X-ray. 
So she herself uses the, the, the metaphor of the X-ray. And of course, this is not uh, at all accidental. It's not by chance that, the, um, uh, that he, Farnsworth, in the same interview, goes on to say that there is a local rumor in the villas that the house is a tuberculosis sanatorium. So she thinks the house is a tuberculosis is an X-ray, and the people in the villas think that this house is a sanatorium. So they all make the connection, in any case, with, the, uh, with uh, tuberculosis. Um, I don't know why she's so worried about the, um, the kitchen being seen from the road, because you, what you actually see from the road very well is the bed, which it doesn't seem to have any curtains or anything. So there you go. So what is with the garbage can? I'm not so sure about it. But I mean, uh, actually, once again, you can see in the Farnsworth case, uh, literally uh, modern architects represented or understood as a piece of medical equipment and once again also a doctor-architect uh, relationship. Very quickly, I'm going to finish with Richard Neutra, famous uh, Lowell uh, House in California, in Los Angeles, who was also, of course, uh, understood as a cranky house, as a, as a sanatorio by none other than, than Benevolo. So a historian of architecture thought that this was a hospital. He calls it cranky house in the, in the label of one of his books. The house, of course, was another doctor uh, co architect collaboration, Philip Lowell, that you see here, and uh, Richard Neutra. Lowell was actually not really a, a, a doctor. He was not, uh, uh, he didn't study medicine, he never did. He took a two week course on, on chiropractor, chiropractice, chiropractor, and went to LA uh, and presented himself as a naturopath and a drug, anti drug physician and became incredibly po popular. He, he had a huge clientele. His theories of diet, exercise, uh, sun therapy, open air, sleeping uh, in the open, etc., were very, very influential. He wrote a column for the LA Times, where he's uh, proposing all these sambas and, and everything. And he, looked, he wrote a column from the LA Times because the publisher of the LA Times was actually one of his, uh, of his clients. And the health house is, of course, uh, organized all around a full regime of sun, air, exercise, diet, etc. It was a demonstration of Lowell's uh, theories. He opened the house, uh, he advertised it in this column in the uh, care of the body in the LA Times, and 50,000 people uh, turned up to uh, this visit that was run by uh, uh, Richard Neutra. Over several weekends, uh, the house was open uh, to the uh, public. Neutra has, of course, his own uh, theories of the relationship between health and architecture and wrote extensively about it in this book called Survival Through Design, where he says that the 20th century individual is under constant threat of disastrous effect and the architect should design therapeutically. So he really understands architecture as a form of therapy and the architect as a kind of uh, doctor. It's important to remember after all these discussions here that Neustra himself has had tuberculosis. Uh, he spent a year in a sanatorium in Switzerland. His brother, who was a doctor, had died of, uh, of tuberculosis. Some of Neutra's uh, clients, many of the Neutra's clients actually in California, were uh, there, were in California for the cure of tuberculosis. In fact, Southern California was uh, um, tuberculosis uh, central, you can say. This is a film called The City of Hope. The TB uh, the tuberculosis sufferer is a wanderer, wrote uh, Susan Sontag in one of her private notebooks in the archives in California. He travels to find a cure. There is a geography of health. This nomadic figure, I think you can say, is also the paradigmatic client of modern architecture, which uh, thinks of every visitor, of every client as a kind of uh, patient who enters modern architecture like ain't in any other medical apparatus. Architecture here, less about surgery and more about a kind of exposure, a kind of X-ray exposure. TB makes the body transparent, writes Susan Sontag, and, and in another, and not in her archives, where cancer uh, is, to, is to have cancer is to become more than normally opaque. I found that also very interesting. She was, of course, suffering from cancer at the time that he wrote illness as, as metaphor. I found that very interesting, too, that you, know, you become transparent with tuberculosis. The X-ray permits one for the first time, she writes, to see one's interior to become transparent uh, to oneself. By the way, the tuberculosis patients in the sanatorium of the 
Magic Mountain used to carry their own X-rays around in their uh, breast pockets. And to finish uh, here, I wanted to bring you a quote uh, from uh, the Magic Mountain when the, uh, Claudia Sosad, who was the Hans uh, Castor uh, love object, leaves the sanatorium, she gives him her X-ray as memento. And he, uh, he writes, then he flanked himself into his chair, Hans Castor, and drew out of his keepsake, his treasure, that consisted this time not a few reddish brown hairs, but a thin glass plate which must be held towards the light to see anything on it. It was Claudia's X-ray portrait, showing not her face, but the delicate bony structure of the upper half of her body and the organs of the thoracic cavity surrounded by the pale, ghost-like envelope of flesh. How often had he looked at it? How often pressed it to his lips in the time which since then had passed and brought its change with it, such changes as, for instance, getting used to life up there without Claudia, getting used, that is, to her remoteness in uh, space. The X-ray, uh, then, in conclusion, is a kind of self-exposure, a new, more intimate kind of portrait of oneself or that which is closest uh, to you, your love object. Analyzing architecture in these terms, I think, is to do a kind of X-ray of it, a disciplinary uh, self-exposure, a way of allowing architecture to see itself, to see what is always there, what has always been there, but somehow had been overlooked. Thank you very much. so much for the inspiring uh, speech. I, I took so many notes. Uh, oh, probably. Okay. I'll just ask my own questions later on. You want me to come there? Yeah, too? please do it so. Yeah. Okay, we still have time. Okay. Um, I will run to the bed because I thought I was late. Not, <laughs> not in a hurry. So, um, Yes, let's start, okay, with your comments and questions, if you wish. Jale, Jalen. Oh, microphone. Say our microphone as well. Thank you very much for this eye-opening, wonderful lecture. I'd like to ask whether <coughs> it would be wrong to um, <coughs> see this uh, X-ray architecture as turning against itself today with all the um, air conditioning and the glass that, I mean, it has created a kind of exigency to go against nature. And also, when you consider the city, uh, animals, insects, pesticides, all this, I mean, what has started as a very healthy movement has now created an architecture which is absolutely unhealthy, I think. What would you say? Absolutely. You're totally right. I mean, this is actually a very interesting uh, point and, and uh, one of the things that I'm also uh, developing because of course, uh, the very machine for health that was uh, developed during this time with so much uh, optimism or with such uh, uh, energy turned against its occupant, like in a horror film, right? with when you start developing uh, uh, sick syndrome uh, building or legionnaire disease and all these uh, diseases that come exactly from uh, uh, having this, uh, this kind of uh, architecture. So the building turns against its occupant. It could be kind of a horror uh, film and a very interesting point because this is actually part of, uh, of, uh, of what could be also developed uh, now. No? So in which way this kind of architecture becomes also um, a health uh, uh, risk and new ideas of what is healthy are uh, influencing or affecting architecture. I think the relationship between architecture and health 
It's actually not uh, exclusive to this moment. It's a very long history from the Greeks that have their theories of, uh, of the healthy, healthy city associated with the theories of the doctors, which is the theories of the four humors that they were organizing their theories of health. So one could look right also the long durée, the long, long uh, association between architecture and, and medicine. And, and right now, I think we are in a huge uh, uh, interesting moment also, because also in this lecture there is this moment in which one uh, may also uh, uh, understood that all this architecture um, became obsolete. In fact, all these hospitals closed the moment that streptomycin was invented. But what is happening now with all this uh, antibiotic uh, resistance and, and the return in many ways to uh, experiments and ideas that were pre-antibiotic. Many of these therapies are coming uh, back and they are considered more uh, sustainable and, and, uh, and, and many things that were left behind, uh, many theories of health, are now being uh, rehabilitated in, uh, little by little and coincides also with a different idea of what uh, kind of architecture is, uh, is uh, more healthy for us and for the planet. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. I enjoyed it very, very much. Actually, I was thinking uh, while you were delivering the lecture that architecture and medicine have much in common because the one is rooted in magic, the other in myth, and they always strive. One is rooted in magic, the other in myth, and they always strive to be a science and that they ne never can, can become sciences. So do you think that this coming closer of the two disciplines is, uh, is also endowing some kind of uh, scientificity, maybe a pseudo-scientificity on each other? I love the idea of the magic and the, and the <laughs> scientific, because it's always there, right? In architecture and in medicine, in both of them, right? Uh, Benjamin writes very beautiful about the difference between the magician and the and the uh, and the surgeon, right? And how the surgeon penetrates into the body and is more like the cinematographer, right? And the and the magi magician that uh, uh, the person that cures, you know. I mean, so this uh, magic is also very much. Uh, we don't think about it that much, but it's very much part also of, what, of architecture. There are many theories of architecture that uh, have theories uh, uh, about magic and about uh, other non-so-rational ideas. The whole 20th century, I mean, that could be another book, very super interesting, about magic uh, architecture and the occult in, in all of them. In all of them, from the dust, that seems all rational, and they were all into some kind of uh, uh, incredible uh, ideas, and, uh, and Le Corbusier, of course, and all of them. So I like very much this, uh, this connection, and I think you are right. I mean, in many ways today, uh, we are more open to these possibilities. This is something that also we have repressed, the question of magic in, in architecture. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, it was very enjoyable. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question, like, uh, did, did, uh, as far as I understood, like there are two theories. One is architectural theory for healthcare, and the uh, healthcare theory for arch architecture, and they are like overlapping with each other. Mm -hmm. But the healthcare theory uh, is based on kind of evidence uh, outside of the architecture, but that evidence is kind of dynamic, that changes through time, like. Uh, the air is not always natural uh, today, like the antibacterial air in hospital. Okay. Or, or the light, like in Egypt, there's a user that can be healed through a shadow as well. So this is kind of changing, dynamic. Uh, my question is kind of, is there any kind of over-reduction system of that idea of evidence of healthcare, like the basic idea is the physical space can promote the healing of patients, uh, but this is always re reduced to kind of only the air and uh, the light, but in a, in a, in a single minute, not open to kind of interpretation in terms of 
the practice of that architecture. Right. Thank you. Neither architecture nor medicine had a lot of evidence. They were all in the dark, you know. I mean, there's a very beautiful book uh, recently called The Ghost Map of, uh, of London that uh, talks about London during the time of the plague. And it's so interesting to see it in uh, urban terms, to uh, how why they have these uh, ideas of disease that were the miasma uh, theory was what you were, you know, they have no idea that the, um, uh, the fountain in a particular neighborhood was contaminated and this is where the source, they had no idea of what was happening. The theories of the, tubercul of the tuberculosis uh, sanatorium, the theories of the sun, there was never, there has never been a scientific, there was never, and there cannot be anymore, a scientific uh, study of how much this was effective or non-effective, right? It seemed to have been effective for people that were not extremely ill, uh, no? I mean, because of course you remove them from the irritant, no? From the cities where the air was polluted, where the conditions of overcrowding, etc., etc. They were also resting, so maybe the immune system uh, actually were effective. But the moment that the antibiotics uh, uh, were invented, they immediately went back and said, oh, that's all, uh, you know, funny theories, etc. But they were, in a way, onto something. For example, the theory that the dust uh, was the, the problem and this mania of uh, early 20th century, uh, also in architecture of providing spaces and furniture that could not accumulate dust, you think, oh, what a crazy idea that this dust that created uh, the disease. But in fact, they were onto something because the tubercles of the bacillus exist for a very, very long time. So you speed right here and you have tuberculosis. And days and days uh, later, this spotum that has now dry and is part of the air is actually contagious. But if you expose it to the sun for only a few minutes, it's not contagious anymore. So it means that they were on to, 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 to something with the dust. The dust was indeed, in some ways, uh, a, a problem, uh, right? Because it carried this bacillus at the time that so many people in a city like Paris had one in three. Oh, come on, you know, everybody, you know, how many? Is, I mean, if we had a health crisis of that dimension now, I don't know what we will be doing, right? But they kind of, uh, so there is not a lot of evidence on one side or another. What I'm fascinated is in the fact that the, uh, uh, the doctor's uh, theory involves thinking about space and about architecture and the architects tuning with the doctors and collaborate. And I found that very fascinating and surprisingly excluded from the history of, uh, of, uh, of architecture. Of course, the kind of air that they are talking about is the overcrowding uh, 19th century uh, city, uh, also the exhausted uh, workers with uh, uh, ever increasing demands on their, on their uh, bodies. So there are also uh, actually quite uh, clear uh, reasons for, for this. So it's a reason why it would be probably healthier to be up in a mountain in, in Davos if you could afford it or in Thonestral removed from the diamonds uh, 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 work, right? But scientific, ooh, well, yeah, not very scientific, but some, some, some science turned out to be okay, <laughs> right? I mean, it's so incredible. For example, a uh, uh, housewife were recommended that, you know, your house is not clean unless you put a Petri dish in your living room to see whether there's still bacteria. So the obsession was science. And, and, and the revolution of modern architecture, that's what I'm trying to say, it didn't come from the architects, it came from the nurses. The visiting nurses that will come to your house and say, you have to get rid of that carpet, and you have to paint the, the, the wall uh, uh, white, and you have to open the windows, and you have to remove this elaborate bed and, turn, and change it for a kind of metal bed with no... Uh, and, and, and it has to be clean this and clean that, and before we know, modern architecture is here, right? So I think, uh, I think the, the nurses invented modern architecture. <laughs> and, the, and the architects, you know, they are, oh, you know, we are, uh, you know, a service profession. We kind of, um, uh, you know, we, have, we are opportunistic, of course, you know. We, we see where there is something that we can help, or we think we can help, and there we go, right? <laughs> Thank you for being with us. I, most of the uh, cases, examples, and references were from West, actually. I can understand it because I'm in 
kind of you are trying to establish a kind of uh, parallel track with modernism. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I mean, East is a different world, yes. especially in this domain. Yeah. When you look at the health issue, for example, the numbers of who, yeah. uh, I mean, the, uh, the problem of health, yeah. uh, the health and urban relationship, okay. uh, the privacy issue, the transparency issue, the X-ray issue, uh, all these issues are different. Have you had a chance to think all these issues in terms of the uh, Eastern geographies, Eastern architecture, Eastern urbanity? No, I haven't. I'm sorry, I haven't. You know, I'm, I'm going against a, a, a kind of established uh, canon of modern uh, architecture to say, you know, you have been saying for all these years, 100 years of saying that modern architecture is about X, Y, and Z. I'm saying maybe there is another possibility as well that is, it has to do with health and disease. But I'm sure you can, uh, you can uh, look into, into it here. I'm sure it, 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 can be, it can be done. In fact, many people from the um, uh, so-called West or the former West or whatever it is, they came to this uh, uh, region uh, when uh, went ill, right? I mean, many people came to the Mediterranean, may, most people. The Mediterranean, before the mountains uh, theory, or uh, parallel to the mountain theory, there was the whole uh, Mediterranean uh, 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 theory. So, it, of course, it affected um, architecture. It is uh, the first hospital that I saw is a hospital uh, in Spain. And you see there is an architectural magazine that puts uh, um, a long uh, X-ray in the in the cover. In Latin America, I I, I had to look into Latin America as well. I mean, I have seen uh, the beautiful uh, hospitals in uh, in Santa Fe and in uh, in, uh, in Rio and, and Sao Paulo. So obviously, uh, the theories of uh, of tuberculosis and of uh, of uh, modern architecture are also part of the of the the theories of, uh, of, this, of this area. But no, I haven't looked in there. But maybe this is something you could do. <laughs> <laughs> because you have access to the language and to the material, and uh, it would be a great uh, contribution, right? May I add a very small comment? On the other hand, I mean, it's a, uh, we all know that it's a very big umbrella of commodification. Uh, very good. I didn't hear. Um, it's a part of commodification. Yeah, the what issue of health, the issue, the issue of health is, part of oh, I see. is a very big umbrella of commodification. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, especially in the uh, West, it is utilized like that, mm -hmm. uh, and it's becoming bigger and bigger. Yes. So, I mean, it is an inevitable, so it, it, it is a certain relation with mm. uh, all the theories of transformation of modern, maybe. This is clearly the case uh, uh, today. I think in the, at the time that one in three in major cities uh, suffers from tuberculosis is a different dimension of the crisis, right? We are talking about a crisis. At, at some point, the survival of humanity, at least in the West precisely, was in, in, uh, in, in, in danger. They were concerned about the possibility of survival as humanity, because the uh, statistics are so uh, frightening and they didn't seem to come up with any uh, way of dealing uh, with it. That, uh, that this was a humongous problem, right? Much bigger than other problems. Thank you. No. Uh, thank you very much. In, in connection to Abdi's comment uh, and the cultural issue in relation to health, yes. um, just an anecdote that I, um, there, is, there was a, a documentary which is labeled Who Owns Yoga? And uh, which, is, which, was sh which was looking f in different places the uses of yoga. yoga. And at the end, uh, they went back to India and 
uh, a wise man at the end, a yogist, and he said, the idea is it works. <laughs> so, you know, yoga at the end works, so that's why it's international. Yeah. Uh, so, um, do you have any, um, any connection to the internationalization of the modern movement? Mm -hmm. Does this health issue has a, a right. connection with that? Right. Right. Yeah, the, we have always talked about the, the internationalization of modern architecture in terms of this kind of spread uh, of the world of the so-called style of modern architecture. But in fact, what it was uh, international and global, as I may have said at the beginning, was the spread of the disease. And this spread is actually urban, as modern architecture is for the most, uh, for the most part. So the, the hypothesis that I brought here at the beginning was this, that the internalization has to do also with the global spread of the disease. People could connect to this idea of the fresh air and ventilation because they have something very concrete and very frightening uh, uh, in their own uh, lives. So that was not some postmodern style arriving into <laughs> through architectural magazine. This was presented to them as a real mechanism for, for protecting um, uh, uh, the body. And I think this has to be uh, accounted for in the success of, uh, of modern architecture as an idea. Why, did, why it was so successful? You may wonder, right? Because it's, it's quite radical, it's quite against uh, what people were expecting. It works in certain climates, it doesn't really work in, in others. And, and why it was so widespread and so successful? And this is one of the things that one could consider. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, so related to the my question is related to the books of Thomas Mann. Thomas so Mann. I think you know very well that book after this uh, presentation. It's, uh, for a long time I'm wondering about that book, the relationship with the architecture, because in that book, uh, Marco, would you please speak up a little because yeah, it's speak up. Yeah, uh, it's it's maybe the funny. direction of the microphone. Um, in, for me, in that book, there is something very particular, particular related to the modern architect. Is, uh, there is the snow, the white, the job of the protagonist in the naval engineering. In that time, the ship was uh, really important for a suggestion related to the modern architect. It's uh, present in many books, the, the value of the ship, the out of sufficiency of the ship. Even if uh, the uh, the quality of the, the lost themselves in a snowstorming, so under the white, and when the snowstorming disappear, appear the white mountain in the front. So, what I'm wondering for a long time, uh, and maybe you can give an answer. That book is uh, as uh, some kind of suggestion towards the modern architect in that time is it an analysis of the modern architecture in that time, or is I am totally wrong? I, I didn't quite understand. No, because the it's very clear. Is not so you hear one well more, well and, so and you it, it don't hear three, yeah. so I don't yeah. Did you hear? Can you translate? I need to repeat. No, no. Thomas Mann's book about architecture. Is Thomas Mann's book about Is the question? No, the question is, no, the question is this. Sorry? I hear him well, so why don't you say it without the microphone? Without the microphone. Without? Yeah. Yes, yeah. maybe yeah. it's better. No. <laughs> it's not, it, what do you have to do? You, we don't hear with the microphone. I had the problem with all the other questions either. I was kind of guessing what the question was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Simplify. <laughs> Yeah. 
where, you know, I mean, I think it's beautiful, I mean, it's beautiful analysis. I think, you know, I always thought that this book was an analysis of modern architecture too, you know. Of course it's an analysis also of tuberculosis at the time, but the association it makes between tuberculosis and modern architecture, the care with which he presents, uh, the way in which the terraces work and the uh, architecture of the building is actually quite uh, extraordinary, right? So in a way, I am very interested in this, uh, in this uh, way in one can look at uh, how modern architecture is perceived, not by what an architect says or what a historian of architecture says or what a critic says, but what a novelist is saying. Right? I mean, I think this is very interesting now that we are trying to do more interdisciplinary work, to try to read uh, uh, novels, uh, you know, for, for this, you know, this is not, uh, as I say, I uh, had the privilege of being in this uh, first year in, in New York in this institute, which opened my mind in that, in that sense of privacy and publicity is full of references to Kafka, to music, to I don't know who. I mean, I read novels most of the time that year. So it's not unique of, of Thomas Mann, but it is uh, very much neglected in architecture. Uh, uh, and and I, I think it's an incredible uh, source of, uh, of, uh, for our research to, to understand a culture, you need to look outside your own uh, discipline, and architecture is part of our, of our culture. Thomas de Man has the most um, astonishing ideas about modern architecture. I think it's, uh, you're right. I mean, there is a, there is a, a beautiful uh, uh, theory of architecture. But Robert Music as well. And when Robert Music uh, says this thing in the, in, the, in the voice of Hans Ulrich, that modern man is born in a hospital and dies in a hospital, and therefore he also should be living in a, in a hospital, or so the architects of his time is saying, I thought to myself, wow, you know, and, and you know, it's full of this uh, reference in, in real care, in, every, in everyone, uh, if, you, if you look for them. Thank you. Great, thank you. Maybe we should have one more question. Yes, yeah, sure. Or, I'm, are you no, tired? no, 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 I'm not tired at all, no. Just stay, you know, till morning. Oh. <laughs> Can also go out <laughs> after whatever. Yes, 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 please. Uh, yes, John, he said, and then one book, yes, please, afterwards. John, yes, sir, did you, John? And yeah, we hear you, we hear you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. It, it, uh, I mean, it is really enthusiastic. I feel enthusiastic after your uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, indeed, your uh, I mean, uh, speech was based on two aspects uh, that was brought by X-ray, the invention of X-ray. One is related with the architecture of healing, mm -hmm. architecture for healing, mm -hmm. and the other one is related with transparency, indeed, uh, an arch architecture that shows, uh, uh, I mean, its content, its right. insight. Uh, but this is more related with diagnosis, maybe, uh, yes. aspect. Uh, but maybe I missed, but how do you relate these two? Right. Uh, because these are two completely different yes. issues, I believe. You're right. Thank you. You're right. It's a very precise uh, uh, question. Um, chronologically, I became obsessed with the question of tuberculosis and modern architecture first, right? Uh, and I start looking at to how uh, uh, all these architects, in fact, uh, is not hidden. I don't have to work very hard, you know. I mean, you don't have to read very deep. It's already there. When the Corbusier says historical Paris, tubercular Paris, or when he says that our houses are like an old uh, coach, or all houses are like an old coach full of tuberculosis. I mean, he's full of references. Uh, to this, uh, so the whole uh, 20th century canonic uh, architectural theory is full of these references, so this is the, what I was doing for a long time, right? And then one day I found myself looking at these images and I said to myself, but they look, I mean, that cannot be an accident. These images are looking also like X-ray. So from there, uh, I make this other uh, research into, if you want, the representation of architecture on the issue of uh, of transparency, of transparency. Why I think uh, they are connected? Well, I suppose in the same way that for Thomas, 
the man are, are, are connected. Thomas Mann writes about the architecture of Davos, and at some point he spends a lot of time uh, talking about this new kind of vision, this new kind of portrait, this kind of uh, thing that uh, uh, Hans Ulrich carries in his pocket. Uh, the, uh, he talks about the patients in the tuberculosis uh, uh, sanatorium carrying the x-rays of their lungs in their breast pockets, right? I thought that, that was so interesting that uh, the buildings themselves, why do they start to look like x-ray? Why do we have to see inside? So at the same time that the dominant technology for diagnosing tuberculosis is the x-ray, all architects are not only providing environmental uh, buildings uh, that could help uh, with this disease, but they also providing buildings that look like x-ray. So they want to be that technology also that, uh, uh, so the desire to see uh, what was previously invisible, what is behind the skin is what you see with the x-ray and the surprise of the critics. Now what I see in a building, the first thing is, the first impression is not the facade, but what is inside. Talks to you about the, the surprise that that generation might, must have uh, experienced. Uh, the surprise and the fear to um, the, promotional uh, film that tried to convince people to have uh, uh, their x-ray uh, taken was trying to counter fears of, uh, of lack of privacy. But in the middle inserts this question that also talks up to us about the fear of the loss of privacy in our houses, all made of uh, glasses, fear of glass houses. Right? So at the same time that the body exposes its interior through the x-ray machine, architecture decides we have to show everything, you know? <laughs> we have to show the structure, we have to show the interior, we have to show... Uh, yeah. So this is how they are connected. Uh, the x-ray obviously is the dominant technology uh, for diagnosis of the uh, tuberculosis, uh, 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 and therefore it's connected also to the, to the disease. Okay. Thank you for the great lecture. Uh, my contribution uh, will be um, not a question, a contribution. Uh, I will quickly actually go back to 17th century earlier than what you have discussed, 19th century. So uh, in the tradition, uh, especially in the East, uh, the Hermogeny style of cities and uh, uh, Vitruvius, explaining about uh, the standards of the eastern uh, cities, uh, the houses, and also the use of glass in architecture especially. Uh, this reminded me ancient hospitals and Hippocrates talking about the importance of uh, the balance in human body, especially the fluids in uh, human body. And so to say, the hospitals, uh, they were serving, uh, as I may now see, for the roots of the X-ray architecture because the design of the hospitals, uh, both in Kos uh, and in Pergamon, and also the treatment of the patients uh, with natural light, and also the breathing cities, the idea of breathing cities came into hand when there were lots of migrants to Rome uh, in the time period of Domitian in 80s and followed by the Hadrian time in the beginnings of second century. So they took actually uh, some uh, advanced methods to, to say, to create natural air uh, within ancient cities. And this was carried further uh, especially in the case of Istanbul, uh, during the time period of Justinianus when Procopius tells us about uh, the city becoming very crowded. So to say, uh, the discussion of the sixth century plague uh, in Istanbul, due to the fact that the city was no longer uh, actually functioning as in the case of the earlier time period, what it, I mean, what it should have served uh, for the rising uh, people and also the, the census records in the time period of Justinianus. 
So these were all written, and some doctors actually from Ephesus, they were sent to Rome uh, to cure some women uh, under sunlight. And this was the case also in the Pamphylian baths, uh, especially one huge window in most of the Pamphylian baths in uh, South Turkey. They were designed to have glass windows, and this was uh, for sun bathing, to get uh, most of the sun to interior space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. No, I mean, this is more a comment, and it's a very interesting uh, addition, and I thank you very much uh, for this. Of course, the relationship between architecture and medicine, as I say, is really very, very strong and very long-lasting. Uh, the first academies of, uh, of design, of Archit Academia del Diseño in Florence, um, it, it was established next to uh, uh, the academies of medicine. So this connection uh, between the teaching of medicine and the teaching of architecture has also been always very, very, very close. Very close. Thank you so much. Uh, Aluk, Aluk, yes. question? Because you raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your <Okay. laughs> game. Okay. Okay. Uh, the microphone is. Uh, uh, yes. Microphone. We don't hear anything with the microphone, but no. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful exposition. I would like to learn more about the further course of the relation between health and architecture, uh, because I mean, in one sense, all the examples you have shown are from 1910s, 20s. So this is the age of modernism, in a sense. Yes, yes. But in 1930s, all this thing is changed, in a sense. So the counter-modernist, it is the age of counter-modernism. So I would like to learn, for example, what the relation is uh, between health issues and transparency and architecture in the, let's say, Nazi era, or mm -hmm. other, uh, and because they are still keeping this health issue as a major issue, mm -hmm. but the architecture totally turned upside down. I mean, it's all changed. Right. So, what what is the relation? Did they find such kind of a link between the discourses between two disciplines? Right, right. This is a very interesting uh, question. You know, the Levens reform movement in uh, in Germany to the movement of uh, uh, exercising and nature and uh, you know sunbathing in the nude and all of this was quite radical and, and almost uh, left, uh, but they weren't absorbed by the, by, the, by the Nazis. In many ways, at the beginning, also there was some kind of tentative uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, attempts to, to incorporate modern architecture. In fact, Mies was so um, convinced that he could work for the Third Reich, that he stayed stay in Germany until very, very late. People think that he left Germany because he was prosecuted. No, not at all. He was trying to work with the regime. Um, uh, Mussolini uh, did the, uh, you know, the Terrani house for Mussolini in Cuba is modern, etc., etc. So these things are a little bit more, uh, uh, um, uh, you know. But they, uh, but then eventually no. Eventually, does not mo uh, transparency will not be part of the Third Reich. They will return to a more kind of traditional kind of Teutonic uh, uh, forms of uh, architecture and they will not be, and in fact all these architects, Gropius, Mies and Breuer, etc., they will end up in the, in the United States or in Latin America, no? so there's the big uh, 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 diaspora of, uh, of modern architects. The topic tries to relate to modern architecture and tuberculosis, it's very precise, it's already about, it's, it's huge in, in its own, right? I could continue, but uh, um, but th then it would be a history of, uh, of humanity, I suppose, from the relations between architecture and medicine, which could be very interesting. But I don't feel myself uh, uh, that I need to do this. Uh, but the relations between modern architecture, transparency, the X-ray, and tuberculosis is the is the project. Um, I have looked at what happens when the streptomycin and other forms of uh, of uh, antibiotic. Um, uh, become more effective, and, and, and somehow how all these uh, hospitals uh, actually were all abandoned. They are now all abandoned. They are ruined. You go to Berlin and you go to all these great, uh, or you go to or in Davos. They have been turned into luxury hotels. Uh, all these old hospitals. 
they don't exist anymore. They were expanded. And then I thought to myself, what is the dominant obsession at mid-century? And if you look uh, in the United States, it seems like it's as if tuberculosis became uh, under control with, uh, with, uh, uh, with medication. Another kind of uh, obsession takes over, which is the obsession with mental illnesses. It has a lot of things to do also with the war, with so many people returning from the war completely uh, uh, nuts from all the, the horrible things they have uh, witnessed or which they have actively uh, uh, particip participated. Um, and a huge amount of the population also, including the women that were uh, left alone in these suburbs in which they normally there was only one car for the for the breadwinner going back to the city and then they were in this kind of fields of potatoes like in Levittown, isolated uh, and with you know they were accustomed to see in the city so new disorders appear like the so-called housewife uh, blues and uh, which was of course from the isolation and the and the thing and this is the age of the valiance and the development of all these medications as um, tuberculosis starts to be controlled, um, uh, the preoccupation with health, mental health issue takes over. And you see that in architecture too. You see uh, architecture trying to respond to these mental illnesses. For example, Richard Neutra, who was obsessed with tuberculosis in the early part of his time, he starts talking after the, the war in, of the doctor, of the architect as a kind of therapist that speaks with the client that is sitting in the living room and telling you her problems and you may uh, try to help her to find or him to find an o another way of, uh, of solving um, them. Uh, so the question of uh, mental uh, illnesses, whether it's uh, psychoanalysis or, or other uh, therapies, is very, very, part, very much part of the of the of the culture of the at least of the United States in the post-war years. Uh, in fact, uh, Richard Nixon declared the Mental Health uh, Day in recognition of a country in which uh, a huge amount of the population was uh, suffering mentally. Thank you. Oh, okay, let me wrap this up. You know, with a small anecdote. Okay. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was given. Uh, a brief text of yours mm -hmm. uh, on X-ray architecture <laughs> for the poster, and uh, it uh, needed a translation into Turkish, and I instantly did. Mm -hmm. And I asked Aishan to see if it was a correct translation, and she was like, "Guan, this is a wonderful, wonderful text, mm -hmm. and yet it has nothing to do with the original one." So, uh, <laughs> so what I'm saying is very simple. We read things, and yet we read things differently. And yours is wonderful as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.